Ooh, yeah. There we go. Ha. So, Blackberry style at work again. So, it's been a while since I made a dynamic video. Let's say that. I think the Tesla Tree Project was dynamic. It was showing a lot of physical things going on. Stuff happening in this reality. But, um, I haven't gotten any real abstract metaphysical stuff in a while. And, uh, I gotta share something. I share a lot. There's ideas that have been bouncing around my head that I haven't fully shared with everyone. And I want to get them out on the table. Because I would like to see them manifest. And see who else can help me manifest. So, let's update my situation. Alright. I'm here in Asheville. I have this machine shop on Intentional Community. Things are kicking. Things are rolling. I'm in the process of winterizing the shop. Um, I have manifested this beautiful soul, Garrett, who has spent a month Occupy Wall Street and after the eviction at Zukai Park and having to process a lot of what went down, he needed a break in through a couch surfer I was interacting with, couchsurfing.org, big fan of. I host a lot of people and I do a lot of traveling with it myself. Uh, said, hey, could you host my friend from OWS? Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah. And she was like, he's a welder, he goes to Burning Man, I think he's right up your alley. And, yeah, he's right up my alley. And he's been here for a week helping me out. We're getting shit done, winterizing the shop, working a little bit on the, uh, the tower. It's basically working with the elements, with the epoxy and temperatures. Um, I got one capacitor built. I'm about to probably build a few more um, Monday. I don't know, temperature's about to drop. We might get our first snow Tuesday. So epoxy and temperatures are like going down the drain. Um, I just got a wood stove in the shop. But the shop isn't sealed yet, so... Um, it could make things interesting for epoxying. I'm trying to get the capacitors done. I'm building custom-made capacitors um, of copper and aluminum. And uh, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, there's two other projects that I haven't fully shared or discussed. One is the idea. I mean, I have, I have talked about it. it's the idea of making a motor of these guys. And so I want to explain that concept. I want to share about what I've been thinking about more of dimensional theory and what I've been calling in terms of electricity, compression, and um, expansion, realizing where I made faults. Um, at least I believe I made faults. And so I'm trying to loosen up by saying this is what the way it is and this is the way it is by being could be this way and it could be this way. Because so far I haven't heard anyone say it is this way and it is this way. Um, and really be that way. And so I'm trying to figure out for myself too and share with you my insights. As I feel a lot of people have been saying, my mind has been going the right direction. If anything, you can watch my channel and see where my mind has been going as I process and analyze all this and explore this and use creative approaches to understand how this actually works. And uh, this is the octogram, by the way. This thing came out beautiful. Oh my god, it came out beautiful. Take a look at that. I love this thing. Keep it like ugh, next to me all the time, and uh, it feels great. So, um, an idea I want to share before jumping into other things. Um, so the whole Walter Russell. So people in this field are very familiar with that term, and I've glanced a lot of his images and thought about it. Um, but he made a statement that really got me thinking. And it was a brilliant concept that made things simpler. And that the electric and magnetic fields are at 180 degrees to each other. Not 90 degrees. 90 degrees is the illusion. I can explain why. And so, let's, um, so this is also me talking about a comet, relating to the idea of a comet in plant formation, if you've seen that video. Let's get it without the shadow. And so... Alright, what I'm going to do is, let's say uh, we have your uh, centrifugal force, oh, well, I'll make all different colors, we have a singularity, okay, we got a little dot, and you got an expansion out from the dot, okay, and then we have 
expansion in to the dot. Okay. And so we have centripetal force spiraling in to a singularity and then spiraling out from a singularity. Centripetal in, centrifugal out. All right. And so as what we've been seeing is that centripetal and centrifugal centripetal and centrifugal force the actions to electromagnetism are aspects of the second dimension um, as exhibited through the torus and so torus is right here okay this is the Marco image originally uh, a lot of people are understanding this concept now what he's saying what Walter was saying and it took me a while to grasp this until I started to see um, there's things he's just not connecting in all his work people haven't seen it is that this is the electric the electric is the centripetal force spiraling the magnetic is spiraling out and this way he says they're 180 degrees to each other however so this is what would be considered a magnetic monopole because you only see one aspect the monopole, the expansion and so then you have that simple concept of uh, not a simple concept um, but the double black hole and a double black hole mm. there we go and then you have expansion out alright so we got centripetal force spiraling in one way, centripetal force spiraling in one way, and then two forces of centrifugal force spiraling out. And so you see the white spiral of our galaxy, you don't see the two black holes compressing in on the center, creating your singularity. They're in the center. All right. And so When this happens, you create a magnetic dipole. The magnetic dipole changes the electric magnetic field to 90 degrees due to the collision. Um, in the favorites on, on my uh, YouTube videos, there is um, a video of two Tauruses colliding, vortex ring collisions. A lot of people have seen it. It's a really cool little 10 second uh, experiment showing this process turning from linear energy to planar energy. And so what I've been realizing more of the concepts is the first dimension, a line, consists of compression and expansion. And so you have a slinky and you pull one side to one side and let it go back and forth. You have a longitudinal wave, a scalar wave, you're having compression and expansion. When you uh, move into uh, transverse wave territory, you get into centripetal force and centrifugal force. Um, and really they're, they're completely interrelated to expansion and contraction. They're just different dimensions of the same force. And so uh, what makes more sense now, and I haven't solidified this, um, but get a new page open is if say we have the double helix alright and in the double helix I was saying we have two positive charges on the outside okay and a negative charge on the center. It could be either way, positive and negative. If one, and the only difference between positive and negative charges, you can see th this is actually through the paper on the other side. One centripetal force is spiraling uh, clockwise, while the other one's spiraling counterclockwise, and it doesn't matter on the orientation, they're actually completely opposite rotations depending on how you flip it. Um, is this is spiraling one way to where there's a midpoint and I'll make the black dot. Okay, that's your neutral point between the charges. And so in a linear sense you'd see, you know, extreme polarities and then a balanced polarity. 
and uh, put in spiraling out. Is the other charge. And so you're having opposing spins in terms of movement. Um, and so you're having current move from one to from one to the other. And so these are negative charges. The electrons would be moving in. Um, but you're, but uh, the notion is um, what uh, say in terms of creating a magnetic field. If the lines were actually following this, I'm not saying this creates a magnetic field. This is understand the, help understand the concept. Is if energy is flowing in one way, then you're getting the opposing flow flowing the other way which when you overlap magnetic fields creates a scalar field. And so uh, the notion is that the polarities with electric ma magnetism is just differences in rotation and that the fundamental forces is one centripetal is one centrifugal. Um, the beauty of all this is it's just it's, it's really simple. It doesn't get much more simple than that. And if you think other people have been there way before me, um, it's just sort of clicking right now and applying it um, to what actually is happening between the polarities and the balance point between the polarities. And so this has helped me figure out more how to build a device with this, a magnetite octahedral crystal, and this. Um, except I'm not going to use the octagram. I'm going to explain why. You can use the octogram. You can use a double octogram, a two-circuit octogram, or a single-circuit dodecagram. And one of the devices I want to build right now consists of, um, I'm probably going to cast, or center, cast magnetite to make my own octahedral crystals. It won't be a natural crystal. Um, it'll still have a lot of the same properties. Basically, I'll be making lodestone, but lodestone in the form of octahedron, um, because lodestone does not have the natural magnetite um, crystal shape. My friend Tyler, who's uh, now working with Marker Rowan up in Ashland, told me of an experiment that he did where he had a piece of lodestone, magnetized magnetite, and magnetite powder. He stuck the lodestone in the magnetite powder, and he took a carbon anode and a zinc cathode or two pieces of metal, <laughs> stuck them in the magnetite powder, and he got a flow of charge from the zinc to the copper. And it's the same thing that happens if you hold a piece of zinc and copper, or if you sink the zinc and copper into the earth, it'll get a flow of current from the copper, from the zinc to the copper. So the notion is, what's creating the energy pump? It's some aspect of scalar energy. Not magnetized scalar energy. There's three iron sites. Two of them are already magnetized against each other. But then you magnetize one of the sites. And so you're getting a differential between magnetic and scalar energy. And really, we have to start understanding there's a difference between the... Um, there is no true magnetic without the electric. This is what Walter Russell was saying. And that there's always a balance in the polarities. And so, what I realized recently that I had no clue for the longest time from reading a piece of misinformation is that magnetite is actually a semiconductor. And what's beautiful about this is when a little bit of energy is pushed into magnetite, it allows it to conduct. And when the energy is removed, it stops conducting, a semiconductor. And um, with a very low um, EV rating, electron volts, at 0.1, very low. And so you, you, can, you can create a pulsing signal with magnetite. And if you take this little magnetite, because this one's really small, an octahedron, has six points and an eight triangular faces. Um, and you put six coils over each of these points. All right? And you magnetize the magnetite through the triangular faces 
not through the points, the triangular faces, all right? You're lining this up as the core of a Merkaba. But the Merkaba has um, eight faces, or eight points, two points pointing at the poles. And so to do that, you need to align the triangular face with the poles, not the, not the tips, such as um, Ho Jose Argels does. He aligns the tips. You want to align the faces. And if you magnetize through the face, one of the things that would happen is there would be uh, three focal points of magnetic energy at each of the poles, at the points. So instead of magnetizing it through the points, right, you're getting these focal points on the points with a neutral zone on the square, you're getting equal distribution of the magnetic field all throughout the crystal, which is what you want. Three on the top, three on the bottom, in each coil around each of the points. However, you create a differential with the coils, one copper and one zinc. Um, there's a, the other thing that's interesting about copper and zinc is that one's 29, one's 30. There's only a slight differential between these atomic structures. There's one thing that, I can't remember his name, he was on Coast to Coast, but talking about an aspect of how materials interact when they're only one proton away from each other. Um, it's the slight differential causes this atomic oscillation between them. And, and copper and zinc was also used by the uh, Egyptians as a form of healing. Um, they, uh, they have a nice symbiosis together. Anyways, uh, the idea is to have these six coils and the copper, um, the question is, does the copper pull in the negative charge or the zinc pull in the positive charge? Because um, we're not connecting the copper to the zinc. If I connected the copper to the zinc, the copper is absorbing the negative charge. So the copper should be absorbing, po taking on a positive charge, while the zinc is taking on a negative charge. And this also relates to, that I've been noticing with my system, I'm putting the negative charge in aluminum and the positive charge in the copper. And this is what Tesla was understanding. So the idea is at these three points, you're creating uh, six centripetal vortices compressing into the magnetite. And then the magnetite is expanding outwards through the six faces on the sides, um, while the two faces on top um, well, there might be eight forces of magnetic expansion. It'll be interesting to see how it works. Technically, the scalar field is formed in the center of the magnetic axis. And so you're utilizing all forms of this energy, electric, magnetic, and the scalar in the system. And so that's one of the things I want to build in the shop. I want to do it with dodecagrams, or single circuit rotating coils, built in this fashion, which takes uh, five uh, wires in a pentagon shape and twisting them 12 times and bending them around and soldering them together, actually brazing them is how I've been doing it. Um, it's a higher temperature solder and much high, much more high quality crystalline solder. And uh, anyways, a dodecagram, what's interesting about a dodecagram? It's a dodecagram, let me draw this out really quickly. Drawn tons of dodecagrams. Um, nope. Another page. All right. I was drawing out the octagram at that time. Alright. So it's a 12 point star that skips every. Uh, five rotations. And some really interesting things about this star. And that the ratio of the the ratio from the center point to the inner edge from the center point or not the ratio, um well the ratio of if you took the shape Okay, you could fit almost perfectly five circles 
around this one circle. And if you take a cut cut view of the, um, the coil spinning around, it's five circles spinning around a hollow circle. And so you're having a fractal structure within the dodecagram, which is on 12 points and five, which, what's it related to? A dodecahedron, uh, 12 pentagonal faces. So you're seeing a symbiosis between the numbers 12 and five. And how dodecagram flows, how the energy flows, involves two pulses. And so if you have two pulses here, or two negative charges here, you have two positive charges here. And all four get compressed in at the same time. It's a swastika. Um, and But it's the notion of having two spiraling in and two spiraling out. Even though they're spiraling in, the illusion is the vacuum getting sucked out. Um, so the idea is this is the energy flow on a pyramid. And a pyramid has um, four four edges coming to a point. Two have energy coming up and two have energy coming down. In my, one of my very first videos I've ever made on YouTube laying out how the energy flows in octahedral in platonic solids, it really focuses on the octahedron in terms of how er easy it is to understand the dynamic movement of energy in an octahedron. Um, and uh, how you can almost imagine uh, also each face is a vo vortex. And uh, if a vortex is spinning clockwise, then each of the neighboring faces are spinning counterclockwise. Um, and so there's this beautiful symbiosis in the octahedron. It's definitely my favorite shape. Buckminster's is the cube octahedron. Um, mine is the core of the cube octahedron, which is the octahedron. Um, I love it. And uh, so where to go from there? Um, oh. And so the, the way those coils bounce or pulse, they all dance together. They're all in unison. All the, whenever this is polarized like so, its neighbors, its four neighbors here, um, have, uh, this would be a, ne if this was positive, positive, this would be negative, negative, this would be positive and positive. Um, and so you have a symbiosis occurring between all six octahedrons as or six coils as they pulse around the octahedron. Now what's beautiful about magnetite is there's the concept of if you actually can create perpetual energy that can keep building and storing itself, how do you prevent it from runaway, from taking it off where there's so much energy they might even just melt the system? Well that's what magnetite is really beautiful about, is it's a built-in governor. And that magnetite exhibits a unique effect called the Verwey transition. V-E-R-W-E-Y. Verwey transition. That's what the, I believe it's the only known material that um, carries it out. And it's the opposite of superconductivity. And that when it gets to a really cold temperature, which I believe is around 93 uh, Kelvin, it uh, goes to this transition where it changes from a semiconductor to an insulator. There's a drastic change in the resistance and a re restructuring of the crystalline material. And so if this system starts to absorb tons of radiant energy from the environment and just sucking it all in, all right, which in converting that thermal agitation into electromagnetic energy and storing it and compressing it and um, pumping it essentially, in the system, it creates a vacuum. And as it's been seen in other free energy devices, when they're actually working, they start to get really cold. They're cooling because they're a vacuum. They're just sucking all this energy in and turning thermal energy into electromagnetic energy. So what happens if you start cooling this to a point where it hits the Verwey transition? Um, when this cools to that point, it turns into an insulator. It doesn't allow it to pulse anymore. It stops the pulsing, and the system will start to heat up. And um, it'll become a semiconductor again. And so this guy will hover right around 93 degrees Kelvin um, and can be a, is essentially a governor in the system and preventing uh, the rest of the system from overheating. Um, and uh, even though if the system's cooling, how it overheat, 
it's so hard to even compute um, <laughs> in some ways. It, it also relates to um, Tesla's notion of impulse DC and how impulse DC works and how when you're actually doing impulse DC correctly and using a uh, high frequency you get um, a cooling effect instead of a heating effect for electricity and that uh, I, I don't know where I was exactly going with this um, well how did the system overheat? There, there could be too much energy um, in the system but there's too much energy it should cause heating but suppose the electrical effect is cooling according to Tesla this is Tesla's words. I haven't seen it myself, um, and uh, I hopefully we'll be seeing it soon. So this is one idea, something I'm working on, um, a project I want to push through. Another project, and so we're going to hop on to another subject. I'm throwing out uh, the three big projects I'm working on. There's a Tesla tire you've been hearing about. It was getting this motor going, and then I want to stir some people's imaginations and explain what I want to do with the stabs I've been building and taking a next step. And so there's a notion of how do you create a lot of electromagnetic energy with one of these stabs? And there's a couple ways. Um, there's one in the tower aspect itself. When you hold that staff up, uh, you're getting, it can, if that star, ta staff is tuned right, it'll start oscillating with your own Earth's electromagnetic field. There's also the notion of spinning around and turning torque directly into electromagnetic energy. And that's understanding the Searle effect. And the Searle effect is, so if you're having this staff and you're spinning it around, well, the magnetic field, which is coming right through my trailer, my trailer happens to be aligned north-south, comes right through this trailer, that the, uh, it's, it's using ideas of like Tai Chi and Feng Shui and working with your environment. And, and spinning the staff around to create work on the staff, which causes electrical compression at either end of the staff. You're getting, and uh, you're getting you're getting voltage essentially at either end of the staff. And when that happens, you uh, um, it builds up against an insulator. This is the Searle effect, and when it builds up against the insulator, uh, the insulator has a dielectric breakdown. And say, like, epoxy has a dielectric breakdown of 40 kilovolts for a millimeter. And so, if you could build up 40 kilovolts for a millimeter of epoxy, it would pulse the epoxy and also damage the epoxy. So, there's insulators you want to use that wouldn't necessarily damage it. And you could also use a semiconductor, like, uh, like magnetite, where if you build up enough thermal energy, it allows it to pulse through. It becomes a conductor then. And so, if you do this, it allows a buildup of charge and then a release of charge. And you can do this, and that's essentially how the Searle device works, but then there's a, a emitter that absorbs this charge. And you make the emitter much smaller than the uh, material that's creating all the electrical compression. And in Searle, Searle's device, he used copper, so he could also use aluminum. Um, so just typical conductors, um, materials that have that absorb um, electrical energy much easier than say he was using neodymium. I want to use titanium. They aren't that conductive. They turn um, instead of allowing electrical current to flow easier, it creates resistance, thermal energy. So if you also have something that's more thermal conductive, it'll also absorb that thermal energy. So not only are you getting the flow of electrical energy, but you're getting the flow of thermal energy into this material. And so the copper, or say you're using copper, we'll just say, or the conductor, the conductor that's the emitter can't handle all that electrical compression that's all of a sudden compressed in, into that through centrifugal force. Can't handle it. It, radi it physically radiates off the conductor into the atmosphere. And this is why... Uh, Searle said you saw green plasma. That's because you're illuminating the air. Air is mostly nitrogen, and when it reaches, I think, a electric field of 75,000 volts, it ionizes, and the ionization is a green color. And so, if you can th essentially throw electrons from the staff, uh, you will ionize the air around you and create green plasma. It'll create aurora, aurora borealis. 
I'm on the small small level. But now you have plasma in the air, and you're spinning a giant electromagnet. Um, that's what's the idea of using the spiral um, staves. You can use the electromagnet to then move the plasma around. You can then control it, which really gets into the idea of like bending the elements, Jedi stuff. And so that's one project I want to work on. Um, I'm actually interested in doing with titanium and uh, aluminum and using uh, magnetite and uh, quartz crystal. And so there's a, in the quartz crystal, you can use it to create a, essentially use it as an oscillator. And uh, so there's more to that idea, but I'm just explaining some basic concepts. There's also a notion of using charge from piezoelectric materials. Um, you could put a piezoelectric ceramic on the bomb, the staff, so you hit the staff on the ground, and it creates you know 10,000 volts. Um, it's a way to also start the system quickly into motion by putting that in, into the system. And if you create, make it an eff effective resonant circuit, the staff will build up charge. And so there's three ways you can put energy into it. Torque, piezoelectric material, through motion, which is slamming it on the ground, um, and then the natural oscillation with the Earth's magnetic field. And so I also want to do this with poi, which then you have two axes of spin, because not only can you be spinning the poi, but the poi head can be spinning as it moves around. So these are concepts I've been working on and figuring out how to, how to make. I really want to make it out of titanium for several reasons, and uh, titanium is just expensive. So there's another idea on the table. And next, the next idea I want to share has to do with the tower. And, well, I'm thinking Wednesday I might take a ride share with Garrett up to D.C. for a day, check out Occupy D.C., and then take a bus to New York City and go work with OWS for a week. He wants to wrap up some things. They're staying in a uh, church. Um, most of them are staying in one of the churches, one of the, a church in, in, in Manhattan. And uh, my brother is also in New York City, and there's this beautiful girl I happen to fall in love with. And while well, she's leaving the country um, next week for Thailand for nine months, and so I'm not going to get to see her for a while. So um, multiple reasons to go up there, and also I want to work the serendipity bug, and and uh, go um, get my hands dirty with Occupy a little bit. I'm very passionate about the movement, and so with this tower. Uh, I want to do a kick. I think um, I'm going to do a Kickstarter uh, proposal to land some more money to work on these projects. But I think what I'm going to do for to get the Kickstarter up and going, um, which can help support several of these projects and get the machine shop really up and rolling uh, with a team. And so Garrett's going to be coming back down with me from Occupy afterwards and working with me here full time on the community, and uh, Paul Ellis, who's in the Vortex math community, is going to be coming down for a couple of days and working with me, um, and uh, Trevor Kagan, who's been supporting me a bit in this endeavor, has been working the uh, investor bug, investor serendipity bug, and uh, making some beautiful things come around, and uh, anyways, with all of this, I really like the idea of Occupy Tower, putting it in a public location for all to see. And uh, just like I'm putting you on the internet for all to see. And that the time of fear is over and that we're showing solutions. And there's a lot of us, there's a lot of us doing beautiful things. And, well, Occupy Tower sounds like a great idea. And so I'm going to put this on Kickstarter and... Uh, see where it goes. The project's almost done, but yeah, the, the epoxy and temperature thing sort of sucks, and making my own capacitors is time-consuming. But they're going to be nice when they're done. And, uh, so, there's some cool things going on. There's some cool ideas up in here. I just need some help getting them into here. This, this reality. Uh, but, I'm close. I'm, I'm really close. I'm getting um, all the coils I've wound and tried to do I am most impressed with this little one right here because of how motherfucking perfect 
it is. And I've not seen anyone really contest this, or I don't, I don't think a lot of people have realized the full potential of what this is. Now, this is just pure geometry, pure, beautiful geometry. It's Celtic knots before your eyes, and seeing how energy wants to move itself. It's wonderful. It's enlightening. I mean, I'm proud of this. I used to have a hard time with pride, going to two extremes, being like, I used to be a cocky son of a bitch. It really was. And, uh, love being the center. I still love being the center of attention. That's so true. But, having to, like, push that away, and instead of, like, you know, taking pride in my fire dancing performances, just be like, you know what? It's just, it's about the performance. It's not about the artist. And push away the, the things. I just want to be, like, bucket head and pull a bucket over my head and put on a Daft Punk suit and not, not feel uh, the things that people were really giving me for my work. And then realizing that there's a healthy balance with pride and that I feel a lot of pride for this and the love that went into this whole process from here to here, the process of manifestation. And the question is putting this to work and, and getting some things out of it. I am lucky that I have a Variac now, and it goes to 2,000 volts, input uh, 18 amps, 120 volts, and uh, I can, uh, I'm going to have to run it at half power, because the rectifier have only works for 1,000 volts at 35 amps, though, which is a shit ton. Um, so I need to get a higher voltage diodes or a rectifier so I can get my Variac at full power and I can pulse some DC charges through this. Um, but I'm not, I'm not really even interested in, in doing it that way. <laughs> um, having two wires going in and two wires going out like with all the rotating coils making and having all these little electronic setups is, I think you can just do it with something like this, something like this, and the rest will take over from there. It's so like, building very organic jewel thieves. I think it can do that. I know it can be that simple. The question is how do we figure it out and see how simple it really is. It's right here. Is that the beauty of physics? Is that all of creation is happening like right here in this little point. All aspects of energy are like right here in front of us. It's happening right now. But we're trying to figure out why I'm breathing out and in, why I can hear the trees rustling, how does this all come to be, you know, it's all right here, it's all right here, and we just have to figure it out, it's a one hell of a jigsaw puzzle, I'm, I'm way into it right now, and it's pretty cool to see how this little dynamic is happening, and how this big dynamic is happening, and the world is changing before our eyes, and so much craziness, like, Wow, so much craziness. Like, it was, it's interesting to think that we had a new moon, and on the new moon there was an eclipse over Antarctica. And so, uh, there's a point where there's a big shadow over Antarctica, which creates a vacuum and causes winds to start spiraling into the vacuum. And so you had a differential between the poles. And this happened on a new moon where there was an alignment with common elenin. Common Allen supposedly wasn't there really anymore, there wasn't much left, but I think there was a magnetic monopole in its place. Comet is just being pulled along by this magnetic monopole. And that uh, the monopole aligned with the Earth and the Sun on the same day. It just happened to be that Elenin was the golden ratio distance away from the Earth. You know, that it was at 1.618 AU, like, come on, like, come on, you know, Douglas Adams would be laughing his ass off right now, he'd be like, falling over, just gonna, like, oh, like, oh my god, he'd be laughing, 
Oh, I love that guy. And, uh... uh I lost my tray. I thought I, I rolled off into oblivion. Um, it was, oh, yeah. Come, Ellen. And anyways, then what happened right after that is that really giant magnetic filament on our sun. I think the largest one on a known record before it was at 350,000 Soho had witnessed. This one was at <sighs> a million kilometers. A million kilometers. You know, huge. And it collapsed. It went boom. And it's created a 180 degree coral mass ejection. Coral mass ejections I've seen, you know, a little way more from like 30 to 90 degrees, averaging 60 degree span away from the sun. 180 degrees, boom, through our solar system. And, uh, moving at 930 kilometers per second, which is the fastest coral mass ejection I've w witnessed since um, I've been watching space weather for the past couple of years. It hasn't been coral mass ejections much until this year. Um, but that's really fucking fast. It's twice the usual speed. And, uh, yeah, it hits us in, like, oh, several hours. So it'd be interesting to see if the gradient so goes down. Interesting if anyone will even see this video because of that concept. That's interesting to think think about. Is what if the grid went down? And this whole video is just for me to like get this stuff out, and so I can just talk in this little black box. I can record it all because it's all about to fry. All of it. It'd be interesting. Personally, I think just the grid systems are going to be affected, and that. The electric grid system is this giant antenna on our planet. If we just tune them right, we get power out of them. But, uh, it's gonna pick up a lot. <sighs> a lot of solar radiation from the solar storms. And, uh, we're gonna have some blackouts because September 26th, we had a huge solar storm, which was um, also aligned with Comelon that related to the Golden Ratio. And, uh, that day, um, except the goal, it was at 0.618 AU. So it's interesting how you're seeing these these ratios. It's just hilarious. Uh, that was the largest solar storm in years. I think this one's gonna top that. So and and what happened within 24 hours of that solar storm is uh, San Diego. The whole grid went out in San Diego. And so, but that wasn't a hydro flare. This is a hydro flare. A hydro flare has the potential doing mega damage. And uh, what happened in the 1800s, it got it heat up the telegraph system so much that the insulators burst into flames. Uh, you know, the actual poles would catch on fire. And so, think of that now. Think of what could happen right now if the whole grid went down. NASA said that such a solar storm could set back our society 10 years. Awesome. Awesome. I think we need it. I really do. And I have compassion for those that would be hurt during that situation. But you have to, that's one thing you have to balance. Because with the Occupy movement, people, you know, some of the things that Occupy are doing are affecting people's jobs. They're like, if you're if you're standing up for people's jobs, why are you causing us to you know not be able to get to work or for our jobs now? Because the things we'll see is this is about sacrifices. Is it's it's the simple notion of it's gonna get much worse, and if we stop it now, and if you hurt now, it's not gonna hurt as much later. If we have done the bailouts and we had let the economy crash as is, it would have hurt then but it wouldn't have hurt as much as it's going to hurt now. So this is the idea. We're on a runaway train. It's picking up speed. We're trying to stop it, and when it stops, it's going to crash. It's going to suck. But if we stop it now, it's only going 40. It's not going to be going 60. All right? That's the thing. We have to stop this runaway train now. Maintenant, as the French would say. Okay. Not today, not tomorrow, yesterday. It needs to stop. Because it's going to get so much more destructive. The beauty is, is the number one thing the Occupy movement is doing 
is it's causing an exponential wake up of people's minds. It's showing that the war on our mind has been so prevalent. The priest police brutality is revealing that the constitution has been eroded. This country is just is almost non existent. It's non existent in the way I was raised. I was raised seventeen seventy six. What I was taught in school, what I believed in, they eventually find out wasn't the case. So what do I want to hold up when I'm at Occupy? I want to hold up a flag, the American flag, with 13 stars on, 13 stars in a circle, versus the linear 50 stars that came about in 1948. 1948 is when our society started to go really downhill after World War II. World War II is the pinnacle say, of human society, of American society. And then it all went downhill after that. Really, the date's 1913, before World War One, the Federal Reserve, when the Freemasons lost control, and the banksters took control. Yeah. So, you can argue what you want, but there are some facts in history. And uh, how I got into all of this, you know, all of this, it's through history, through archaeology. That's what I was going to school for. It was my passion. Uh, because the science is interesting. I was a science geek math guy growing up. But I'm really into the social stuff. And this is a vehicle to propel the social stuff. I am ready for revolution. It's just like, it's in my blood. It really is. has been since I was a kid. And I'm definitely for the non-violent. So I'll stay on the record. I think it's time for a new America. Or if anything, it's time for an old America. Maybe with a new spin on it. But we're seeing a reflection of the American Revolution happen right now. And Occupy Rome just got a little violent. And so you're seeing violent in Greece, in Athens. The birth of Western civilization. And now Rome. Or is next London? and then New York City. Because what you're going to see topples if Greece topples. Okay, that is the biggest metaphor for the collapse of Western civilization, the place where it was born collapsing. And then Rome. Rome's in a lot of financial trouble right now, Italy. And if you saw those four big signs of Western civilization fall, Athens, Rome, London, New York City. Bam, 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 bam. be interesting if it falls just like that. History repeating itself in the most unusual of ways. And you're seeing an American Revolution take place again, a second American Revolution, in that the people of this country were fighting against the British, were standing up against the British, saying, you know, no taxation without representation. Um, and it had to do with this elite aspect again and also a financial aspect but after the revolution the US or the Americans create a whole new system what I think would be interesting is if this cycle did repeat itself the big difference is I don't think we would create a whole new system I think we might take that same old system Maybe modify a little bit, create more fail safes. This is what George Washington was really big. Creating fail safes, checks and balances the systems, but creating such a way, these checks and balances in such a way that this can not happen again. And that's one of the most important aspects, which I haven't heard much people talk about in this movement, because in, in school, for some reason, we really focus on the central banks and talking about the central bank issue and how big it was post-American Revolution because many of the Founding Fathers understood that the central bank had the power to destroy the country. 1913, our country was destroyed and became something different, an illusion. And so, 
I'm, I'm all about the science. I'm all about the energy revolution. But it's really a vehicle to repel all of this and all of this. The external and the internal to help all of us evolve and all of us grow. And so... <laughs> yeah! Woo! Feels good. It feels really good. I wonder if anyone's going to get to see this video. It does feel good talking about it. I found this lovely stone in a mine. It's a rhombic dodeca... dodecahedron of garnet. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It has some really nice faces on it. Um, and, uh, I think I'll leave it with that little beautiful piece. And, uh, you can watch me sip some pomegranate juice. Ready? Ready? It tastes good. God did a good thing with pomegranates. You ever take one apart? Crazy. Very alien. And so with that, concluding on garnets and pomegranates, I would like to say good night, good evening. I love all of you. You were all beautiful. 99, 1%, whole, nothing, all. You guys rock. Banksters, you're making this a very interesting story. Thank you for spicing things up. Give you a thumbs up. I just gotta play my character and, like, stop my feet. Thank you for allowing me to stop my feet. It's fun to, you know, express that righteous anger. It's a good, it's a good role I'm playing. Love your role, too. I wouldn't like to be in it, but thank you for playing it. Until next time, adios. Namaste, my friends. May the force be with you.